Hello and welcome to another special edition of Celebration of Mind. Of course, today's broadcast is viewable at celebrationofmind.org slash live. Give yourselves a round of applause for being smart enough to be here. We're actually on live right now with Princeton University, where we're going to see some amazing guests and some wonderful presentations from Princeton's Celebration of Mind. So I'm going to go ahead and turn us over to our view of the stage and the presentation that's about to begin, and uh, enjoy. And it looks like people are just uh, gathering in the room right now, and they're about to get the uh, event underway. So while we have a few moments, again, we'll just remind everybody that we're coming to you live via celebrationofmind.org slash live, where there's a join hangout button, and we have an audience, a virtual audience, uh, George Miller out in our on-air hangout, as well as uh, Sweden joining us with uh, Hacken. Hello, Hacken, and Nancy all the way from uh, Canada. So we truly have an international audience, as my phone is ringing. Let's go ahead and tune back into Princeton. Me. We're live on air. Welcome to Mark Seda Ducati, who is seated in the audience at Princeton University. Mark, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today and bringing us this presentation. Do the. If you can hear me. There we go. So we get a double point of view. We'll be able to see the speaker and the slideshow presentation as well. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Princeton University's first celebration of life in honor of our environment. Oh, not at Princeton University? Oh, they're good numerals. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, well, right, at least. Three years worth. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm Kate Kernan. I've been to the University. I'm Vicki Kernan. I'm the Matt Medicare Princeton University grad and host instructor with the Office of Mathematics Department. And I want to introduce to you the chair of the Mathematics Department, Dave Kabai, who will introduce our speaker. After our speaker, we will have a panel discussion with some of the people who knew Mark Gardner very well. So I hope you enjoy the evening. Stay blessed. Okay, so it's, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, special lecture by Takashi Tokiyada. And before I go, I'd like just to thank 
Vicki Kern, who's executive editor at University Press, who, who put this whole event together, and Princeton Press was sponsoring this event. And I should say that I never met Professor Tokieda before today, but I've heard about him for many years from my colleague Peter Osmia. They were they were both graduate students here at Princeton, and, and Peter told me about this amazingly brilliant guy who became a math grad student after after beginning a career in, in classical literature. Someone who arrived knowing to a multitude of, of languages. He joined the Russian table at, at Princeton knowing the Russian and came practically fluent a few weeks later. He effortlessly picked up topology and ultimately wrote a thesis with Professor Bill Browder. He's sitting here in the front row. And, and to quote Peter, he said, Tadashi was incredibly funny. And now Professor Tokieda is Stephen and Thomas Corner Fellow and Director of Studies in Mathematics at Trinity Hall, University of Cambridge. And this academic year is a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard University. And as a mathematician, something there's one thing that I just tremendously admire. And that is when someone sees things that are hidden in plain sight. And by which I mean to, to look at something that has been well studied and yet to be able to see something new and interesting. Okay, can you hear me? And Professor yes. Tatiana has done this repeatedly in the context of in the context of toys, where for example, ordinary toys viewed with the right eyes become exemplars of subtle physical phenomena. So in, in his words, toy in this context means an object of daily life which we can find or make almost instantly, yet which, if played with imaginatively, exhibits behavior so surprising that it'll leave good scientists puzzling over it for quite a while. Now conversely, Professor Tokieda has combined his ingenuity and deep understanding of physics and dynamics to create new toys. So let us warmly welcome Professor Tadashi Tokieda, who will speak on coin models. Yes, Vicky. Yes. Okay. We're getting feedback, so I I left, and it's, it's very distracting. For some okay. reason, I can't turn the sound off. Oh, there's Mark. You could you could turn you can can you control the volume? Um, right now we have Mark uh, bringing us the actual presentation from his laptop. So if you could. So I won't worry about it then. I guess not the end of this tube. Yeah, right. for right now. <laughs> And yeah, Mark is, Mark is on there. So, a priori, you don't expect any reason why you should see the black and then the more and vice versa. Now, I should say, oops, I have this. If, what do you see? I see black, don't you? I see black. I see the black dot. Maybe we'll see black rather than orange, because black is a darker color than orange. But now, if I rub it against my hair yeah. and lock it again, I see, I see orange. I see orange again. That's it. Yes. So if I tap it on the table, you see that again. I can lock it with my left hand. It's still that. But if I rub it against my shoulders, it becomes more. So that's the first mystery. Why sometimes do we see black and sometimes do we see orange? The second mystery, however, I don't think you can see it that's very well on the camera, is when you see black, how many do you see? Four. Four. I think I see four. Yeah. You see? Four. Yes. Four. And when I, I have to rub it in a second. When you see orange, I'll leave it to the mother. 
No, no, it's still, I hope it's open. Okay. I, I've seen it open, and then there aren't many of us. Anyway, you see it always open. So what is cool about this? It's not as if I'm launching it to with any care. It's completely random, but not that. It's always open. You know what I'm saying? I wrote another two. So this shorter two, I'm going to show you that. So, Shows that, but I hope you can see it's defined. Okay. You can see it's outside the radius. So, you have to write this thing? Three. Three. So, I think it's three. And also, if I want to show you the current, again, you have to wait for it a little bit, but again, you see it. So, you see four, and you see three. What is four about this? What is three? Yes, somebody is already guessing. So let's try to understand what is happening. After some experimentation, we see that the longer one shows you four spots and the shorter one is three spots. And I'd like to begin by um, offering a zero solar explanation, which in fact is a bit suspicious, so then I'll tell you the full story. The whole story is very sophisticated but easy to understand. The way I'm launching those tubes, as you notice, is to pinch down on it, on them, as I did. Now, in order to um, make the terminology straight, let's make a distinction between um, two terms. This motion is a supervision of this motion, which we shall call revolution. And also, the thing is spinning around this axis, so to speak, like that. Let's call that rotation. So this spin is rotation, this spin is revolution. Okay. So when I pinch down, let's focus on what happens at the other end that I did not pinch down. Well, that end, you see, is going to go forward like this because of revolution, but at the same time, at that end, you get a top spin which is a rotation which adds to the revolution, so that end is moving quite fast. In contrast, at the end of that inch down, it goes forward because of revolution, but at that end you get a fast, which gets subtracted from the revolution. So it's revolution minus rotation, that end is going slower. So the fact matter is that we see the end that I inch down, and that end is the end that's going slower rather than the end. That's going faster, so let's see that. That's so, so if I pinch down on black, you see the black, and after carefully running it, I just <laughs> if I pinch down on orange, you see you see the orange. Okay. So the end that we see is the fast end, uh, sorry, slow end, and then that we don't see is the fast end. That explanation is plausible, but it's not fully convincing. After all, why should we see the slow end? Maybe if human eyes have a certain frequency that captures the fast end. Also, this explanation, zero fold explanation, mind you, does not explain at all why four, why three. So let's try to understand the full story. In order to understand the full story, please imagine that in the course of the motion, <coughs> when I launch, The tube is spinning and spinning, with one end slightly up, it turns out. While it's rolling like this, pleasing your imagination, put from above a transparent ceiling, just so as to touch the top of this spinning tube. Okay? So, this tube is rolling and rolling and rolling on the floor, and it's moving under the ceiling. Now, you agree that there is an up and down symmetry of this motion between the floor and the ceiling. Well, up and down symmetry means that if the tube is rolling on the floor, it's also rolling under the ceiling. Okay. What are the consequences of this? When you have, this is 
circular cross section of the tube with a mark, mark spot rolls under the ceiling, what kind of trajectory does that spot describe? It has been studied extensively by classical mathematicians, and that's called a cycle. It's this curve, which goes like that. And you can see that it has cusps. And those cusps, well, imagine that you're driving a car along this road, and you come into this corner. It's not a U turn, it's a V turn, so to so speak. Um, and then you have to come back out. Well, at that point, inevitably, you must stop. You don't keep going. That means that in the course of this motion, at those points, at those cusps, there's zero velocity. In other words, instantaneously, just that instant, it stop, stops. That is why, as seen from above, you see those points puff, 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 puff so clearly. But there's another effect. You see, at those, at these points, those cusps, the tangent is vertical, and you're looking down this motion from above. Which means that you see the velocity with which it's coming becomes vertical at that point. That means that the horizontal velocity which you are seeing from above gets really squeezed at those points. So the picture is a little exaggerated. It's not so tilted as usual. And it usually goes around and around. And while the bottom end is rolling, the top end is also rolling under the ceiling. And that's why you see it's not clear. How many? As many as there are those branches of cyclones hitting on this large circle. But what is that large circle? Well, the circle, the diameter of that large circle is basically the length of this tube. Yeah. And this cross-sectional circle is rolling, and that's going to give you the, um, the, so the gap between those so <coughs> cycles. So the number of cycles that will fit is no other than approximately ratio of this length to the diameter of the tube. So, what you saw this four was simply the aspect ratio of this tube, four to one, and the tube that showed you three is an aspect ratio of three to one, and that is why you see four spots, and that is why you see three spots. Now, when I began to analyze this uh, phenomenon several years ago, uh, of course I didn't understand what was going on. So I went <laughs> off and cut a plastic tube into integer ratios, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, and then started experimenting. And finally, um, as you see, we understand it. I very much regret not making tubes in non-integer ratios. For example, we can tell immediately what happens, but we'll see if the ratio of this tube were not 4 to 1, but 3.9. Well, you will see four points, but processing program slowly, yeah. moving, shift, drifting slowly. <coughs> if the ratio were 4.1 to 1, a little more than 4, then you will see four spots again, processing retrograde slowly. But what if the ratio was 3.5 to 1, exactly a half inch? Well, the tube has to decide what it wants to show us. Is it going to show 4, 3? I have no idea. I like the right very much indeed. Okay, so that was the, um, an example of a motion that involved two cycle motions, um, revolution and rotation, as we saw. What kind of geometry lies behind this? This is, in fact, familiar material to almost all mathematicians who are familiar with the classics. If you have one cycle motion, that's, let's say, rotation, which is being carried along, drifting along by another motion, then the trajectory that you see is obviously, you can imagine, sort of a spiral motion along this cylinder. But in our case, the other motion that's doing the drifting, the revolution, is also cyclic, it's periodic motion. So you have to compose this periodic cycle motion with another periodic motion. It's as if you are blowing this cycle motion along a circular wind, and what you get is a spiral pattern, a spiral trajectory, but winding around and around on a surface of a torus. And it is a remarkable discovery of the late 19th century and the 20th century that it turns out all, in some precise sense, Hamiltonian and complete integral and all that, all dynamical problems that can be exactly solved exhibit trajectories, spiral trajectories, on such tori, American donuts. 
like to say American donut, people say this is the country so where donuts don't have this topology. Yeah. <laughs> American donuts. So, the, so these are called the invariant donut. Um, and that's the vision that Pompeo had. This is quite um, nice. I would like to mention, however, that there are some other remarkable things about this. That in this case, initially, as I pointed out, I'm launching the tube very, very casually. I mean, I'm not controlling the initial conditions at all. So initially, there's a lot of sliding going on, but very soon it transits to roll. And it's thanks to rolling that you get these cycles and so on. So it's interesting. If you think of, may I speak about the phase space? I think I can. So the phase space of this, uh, this problem, it's almost all dissimilar. There's a lot of friction because of sliding. But in the middle of this, there is this invariant torus. Yeah. And this invariant torus, with spiral trajectory, is telling a non dissipative conservative dynamical system. And that's, why, that's because rolling involves almost no friction. So you have this conservative invariant torus in the middle of this big um, dissipative phase space. And this invariant torus is a global attractor. All the trajectories arrive at infinite time. Mind you, in a smooth dynamical system, usually you get some sort of exponential. Not in this case. You get to the infinite torus in finite time because the transition to rolling takes place in finite time. So it's a very, very remarkable and uh, very peculiar system indeed. Okay, that's when um, you can solve the problem in some sense exactly. All was very stable and very neat. What happens if we subject this kind of problem to external disturbances? Mathematicians have talked about perturbations. Will the main features of the motion survive the perturbations or not? That's the problem of stability and instability, which I'd like to discuss in terms of an experiment. Every once in a while, you run into a person who happens to be carrying around an inclined plane. <laughs> and those are two objects that I made from stress of us. Now, you agree that if I try to balance this, the one that is pinched in the middle, I can kind of balance. It's, it's, I have some chance. Okay, I'm beginning to balance it, okay. Whereas the one that's bulging in the middle, I have no chance. It's very, very strong. So, this statically is stable, and this statically is unstable. Let's now let them roll down this incline. First, <laughs> this. Oh, that didn't work. How about this? Oh, that works. In fact, I barely have to watch what I'm doing. This works very well. Whereas this, if I try to go with some minus point, to be very careful. Oops, no, I missed at the end. That misses completely. No, that's very bad. <laughs> I never succeed, whereas this one always works. So it looks like this one really wants to go down here, whereas this one is so very sideways. Always. So you can say that this is very stable, this one's stable. What on earth is going on? Is that intuitive? According to the idea of perturbations, which conditions like very much, let's imagine that we are rolling those uh, espresso things down the slope. This is the view from in front, if you like. And this is the direction which it goes. But what are the chances that I can set it going exactly centered, well, near? So inevitably, there will be some error. And let's say that it's been shifted a little bit to the side, and then we start going. What's going to happen? Well, you see that. If you look at the rail, this espresso cup is touching the rail over here along a fairly large circle. You see that? Along here. Whereas at this end, it's touching the circle, touching the rail along a very small circle. So effectively, you have a pair of wheels, a large wheel and a small wheel. And how will such a device roll, large or small? Of course, it's going to go this way yeah, if it rolls. Well, that's the direction contrary to in original shift. That means whenever there was a slight error, an automatic mechanism exists in the system that corrects that error, brings the thing towards the center. And that is what we mean by stability. 
self-correction mechanism. We often say that that person is not told he's a stable person <laughs> because he is capable of correcting his In contrast, if you have this shape, a pinch in the middle, okay, and let's say that he starts a little bit off center. Well, in that case, you see it's touching this rail along the small circle, the other rail along the large circle. That means that the, the positions of large and small are reversed. And of course, this system will roll, roll off to the left. But that's the same direction as the direction of the original error. That means that when there is a small error, there is an inherent automatic mechanism in the system that keeps exaggerating the error more and more. And that is what we mean by an unstable system. So um, we might only say that that is an unstable function. That's because whenever he commits an error, he makes a bigger error. So that's what it so stability and instability come out of this consideration, and whenever we look at the problem, that's very important. Now, it is in the nature of mathematicians, and especially as mathematicians, that whenever a model has been sorted out for certain, for certain phenomenon, a mathematician wants to stretch the model, looking at extreme cases, and try to break the model and see how it breaks by looking at new phenomena, by finding and new limits and so forth. And watching the model break um, tells us something new about the world. Maybe we can upgrade the model to something more powerful that does not break under these things. Or maybe we have to invent a completely new one that takes over from that, that, that thing. So, so let's try to stretch this model and um, this modeling discussion from instability to what happens when you have many, many different things interacting together. So far, we have been rolling a single object down, single object down. What happens if you have interactions among many objects? <coughs> Here is a box that I found on a sleep market. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Chai Brzezinski extra, um, Georgian extra key. And when you open it, it has it's a very large giant an interior lid which explains in scientific detail how to brew a cup of tea. That has nothing to do with the experiment. I just <laughs> carry around cedar balls inside. Now, what, one thing you can say about this experiment is that it smells nice. <laughs> and on the other hand, this is a soup bowl that I, I mean, borrowed from Cambridge University. And if I put three spade balls, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Let's swallow this dish, by which I mean doing this. And you can see when I swallow that the syllables are circulating in the same direction that I'm swallowing. I'm swallowing like this, and the syllables circulate in the same direction. Because we are among compactable grown ups, I'd like to point out that when I say swallow, I don't mean doing this. That's rotation. I'm staying in the translation of something, if you like. Which happens to be periodic, so every point of the um, object is uh, of the half is described in circular orbit that I'm swirling, I'm not rotating. Then you see the syllables go around in the same direction as I'm swirling. Now, let's increase the number of syllables. When I swirl, you see they start going in the opposite direction. Do you see that? Uh -huh. <laughs> So there was a transition, which one, you can imagine that the ball goes circles in the same direction as the swallow, two, same direction, three, we have seen, same direction, four, still the same direction, at five, there's some hesitation, there's some hesitation, <laughs> at six, there's so much hesitation that you don't know which way to go, at seven, it becomes pretty clear that they're going back, and eight, and so on. This is a metaphor, metaphor for what we call a phase transition. In other words, the same physical system, but depending on the external conditions, exhibits one behavior or chooses to obey another law of physics altogether and exhibits a completely different behavior. And it's a bit like a transition from gas to liquid, this from run up to sea level to seven to eight. And in order to show you that it's really like from gas to so that as liquid, we have been increasingly 
なんか、全然スイーツそう。<笑><笑> what's happening here is that we have only two of them. You see, what's driving these syllables is the fact that the wall of the soup bowl is banging against them. So each time it bangs, it transmits the momentum going around and around. So it's a momentum dominated motion, if you like. But if you have lots of them, so that the sea levels start touching each other, then whatever momentum that comes in from the wall gets dissipated because there's so many contacts among the neighbors. At the same time, what is not lost is the fact that you see these sea levels are rubbing against each other. So when the wall rubs against one sea level, it starts rotating in one direction, and that rotation is transmitted to the next sea level, and so on. It is an angular momentum dominated. Regime, if you like. And that's why this crowdedness or the density of the sea levels affects in a dramatic fashion the transition from one dynamics to another dynamics. So it is a good metaphor, as I say, for phase transitions, such as the transitions that you see among vapor, liquid water, and ice. It's the same H2O, but the behaviors are at a very, very different, for different states of the matter. It's a metaphor because it's not really a phase transition in the rigorous sense that statistics use this term, but it is nonetheless a good point for phase transition. So that's what happens when you have many interacting objects interactions inside the system. Let's see what happens when now you start changing some parameters of the system. For example, we saw that the fact that the those sea levels are going the wrong way has to do with the fact that the sea levels neighbors are rubbing against each other. It has to do with the friction. Let's consider the scenario where the friction it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. What happens then? Well, naively you would expect that when the friction becomes zero, well, you recover. Initial case when the particles or the low sea levels don't talk to one another, they just bang against each other. So you go back to the momentum in the regime. The best, although rather difficult way to understand this, I think, is to look at the classical transition. This is a photograph, and we have a photograph of a flow going from left to right past a cylinder. You can also think of it as a sphere. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. And there is turns out to be a very good way to think about this called Reynolds number. Mr. Reynolds was in Manchester in the 19th century. And this number, which is dimensionless, scale invariant, is for any flow uh, past some obstacle, the product of density times the size of the object times the speed of the flow divided by the viscosity that's the thickness of the fluid. What we want to do is to play with the viscosity of the thickness. We want to bring the friction down. But, you know, changing the thickness of the fluid is quite difficult. Maybe you can change the temperature and so on, but it's difficult. But you can see that because Reynolds number is the only thing that matters, instead of decreasing viscosity, I can, for example, increase the speed. And this is how we shall do those, do, do those experimental pictures. So, in the, what follows, we shall be increasing the Reynolds number. That means decreasing the viscosity, but actually, in actual fact, we are increasing the speed. Okay. Now, when the Reynolds number is very, very small, that's when you have a very viscous, sticky fluid, like you know, honey uh, going slowly and so on. The pattern of the flow that you see is lamina. Lamina, lamina in Latin means sort of uh, thin slice, so it's organized flow, it's organized into um, very smooth slices, lamina flow. That's why Reynolds number is 0.1. What happens if I increase the Reynolds number 104? Pen, then you see the nascent pattern behind this uh, obstacle, which is remarkable, a pair of vortices that are shed, and they just stay there, spinning, 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 as the flow goes past. That's what happens at the end of the 10. Let's make the fluid even less viscous or faster, raise the Reynolds number by a factor of 10. And then what you see is this. The flow is from left to right. That's the obstacle. And then you see this beautiful alternating pattern of vortices called the Karman vortex. I 
think this is one of the most beautiful experimental photos that have taken in the history of science. And it was taken by a Japanese experimentalist in Kyushu. He passed away recently called Anela. We can't not acknowledge the contribution of those uh, really hardworking experimentalists, but I think we should, especially when they work uh, with such an artistic sense. So that's the pattern that you see at Reynolds number about 100. So when it's getting less and less distance. You can see this pattern in all, all scales. Here is a photograph that was taken last year um, from above, of course, from the air. This is, a, a, if you like, a carpet of clouds streaming along above green. But there's a peak of a mountain which is sticking out just above the carpet. So this cloud is being uh, torn aside, apart, and behind this um, peak, you see this pattern that's the common vortex stream. That's a huge scale. And there's something interesting going on, I think, because at that scale, the Reynolds number must be terrific, terribly high. So why are we seeing this? I mean, we should see this around the Reynolds 100. But maybe that's because the viscosity that's relevant is not the viscosity you see there, but there's something of any viscosity, but that's <laughs> professional. Too. So that's what we get. And if you keep decreasing the viscosity, you make it less and less sticky the friction, then you get this mess at Reynolds 1000. It's called a turbulence. Huge amounts of water is sort of interlocking each other and so on. It's that scale going on. It's terrible. Messier and messier and messier as you decrease the friction. So what do we think happens if the viscosity becomes zero in the limit? We will expect maximum messiness that this chaos. But what happens? Is. Again, you are back at the Reynolds number infinity to random metal. So there is a discontinuous behavior that nature exhibits. You would imagine that nature keeps doing what it likes to do and sort of exaggerates the pattern more and more, but at the end, the path it comes back to where it started almost the exact opposite um, scenario. By the way, I cheated when I used this because this of course, a hot copy of that. <laughs> so, and I have to confess that the low Reynolds number flow and, um, you know, invisible flow when the viscosity is zero, they don't look exactly the same. At far field, for example, the low Reynolds number flow feels the um, existence of solid objects much, much more acutely than invisible fluid. However, the fact that they both have lambda features, so very well organized and no bodies is anywhere, is true. And also, near the uh, solid object, those are pretty much in distinction. So that's the um, discontinuous limit. Let's see a discontinuous limit in a more um, immediately obvious context. Those are two um, peptides, seven ones. And I can guarantee to you that they are the same weight. <laughs> And also, let me say it this way, the distribution of mass within each heptagon is uniform, homogeneous. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing hidden. I mean, what you see is exactly what it is. Okay, so there's no, no trick such as, oh, this looks like that, but actually there's a lot of mass concentrated on the rim and there's cavity inside. None of that. It's homogeneous and equal mass polygons. However, when I try to roll them, One of them goes quite willingly. The other one, when I talk about it, refuses. It's extremely This one goes very nasty, goes too nasty, and this one doesn't go. There seems to be no difference. So you can superpose them and see through, and you can't read them. So, what is going on? This was, by the way, invented by my friend Andy Wiener of Cornell University. And I should mention that this experiment was first studied in a different form by my lab. So, it's very curious. What's going on? Ah, ah that's true. Okay, so let me roll with the left hand so that this rolls. Okay, so that's this is the one that rolls. When I put it down, 
It's not the same as memory. It's just that the one that was given to you. So that's very strange. Okay, I told you that they have the same mass. I told you that the homogeneity, about homogeneity of the mass distribution. Of course, there's something else that I'm not <laughs> I didn't tell you that they have the same shape. Wait a minute, they do have the same shape. No, I didn't tell you that they have the same shape. It turns out that one that rolls, that's this one, is not a heptagon, but it's a heptagon whose sides have been slightly polished, so as to make it complex. The one that refuses to roll is a heptagon whose sides have been slightly pushed in more than made it concave. And you'll see that the difference it makes is dramatic. The one that's slightly complex, so it's been bulged out, so it's kept along, but slightly bulged out. As it tries to roll from one vertex to the next vertex, the point of contact can smooth, continuously transit from one vertex to the next vertex as it rolls. So, okay, you must hurry up, but you can do this continuously, smoothly. So, epsilon is, if you like, the bulge itself. In contrast, if you have the um, one that is completely straight, what happens is that while it's trying to roll, roll this pivot stays at the pivot. There is no transition to the next pivot. So the entire edge is, if you like, in levitation and comes into contact with the ground only when the next vertex goes bam, and that this case the entire edge. And that's why. However, slightly it bulges out, and theoretically, if this epsilon can be any strictly positive number, but very small, you can get this smooth, nice rolling. Whereas when epsilon becomes exactly zero, suddenly there's a discontinuous limit, and boom, it stops rolling. So that's uh, an example which was experimentally discovered by Green, as I said. How small is epsilon? Thank you very much. I'm glad you asked. Um, the actual difference between uh, those two things is less than 0.1 millimeter. Now, the diameter of this thing about 10 centimeters, that's less than one in a thousand. So, let's say that you are, allowed, you are about to pay a bill of $100 and you are over, arguing over a change of a few cents. That's what it is. And it's extremely small, but it makes a completely different quality picture for, for those people. And theoretically, if the table is absolutely rigid and so on, you can see this difference for any person, every person. But when you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, at the limit you can. Tables are made of atoms. <laughs> Tables are made of atoms. Yeah. Um, so if you do this on, uh, say, a, a carpet, everything goes. Because carpet changes its shape so soft and hides the shape that there's no everywhere. It's harder and harder to be made. So I think that the best you can do, probably in terms of atomic sort of possibility, is maybe one tenth or one hundredth of this, because most of the tables that we use, that even model of table, are slightly soft. And it's quite amazing that actually we and I managed to get it down. So far. I think it's probably about one hundred times. And part of one is still away Okay. Okay. So that's what it is. And um, before we go, I'd like to have a little commentary because we don't have it yet. Okay. I showed you earlier this um, <coughs> swelling picture. And I say that it's metaphorically a phase transition, but not rigorously a phase transition, but it's a good point. Well, here is another kind of transition, but which is a bifurcation. So bifurcation is not far from transition. You might have seen this, it's called a hui stick. This is handmade by me. It's a propeller that's stuck on the stick, and there are notches along the stick. So if I run along those notches, the whole thing vibrates, but there's no reason why the propeller should spin, start spinning one way or the other. Now, if I channel my oriental energy into this, <laughs> I can make it skin this way. Yeah. 
It's like, <clears throat> oh, I can make it spin this way. <laughs> oh, I can make it spin this way. <coughs> and seem to be doing exactly the same thing. Now, in case you don't find that mysterious, yes, um, not like world's premiere, but something that's not known. <laughs> I wrote um, here a nut and bolt. I hope you can see it's all for us. Uh, so that this um, nut is quite loose and bolt is, uh, you see. And here is the cheapest um, electric toothbrush that I could find in this one. Now, unfortunately, the end of this toothbrush um, goes back and forth, so it's back and forth, but that's red herring. And so, if you have a pure vibrating toothbrush, that's okay too. So now, if I translate this vibration on the bolt, of course, the whole thing vibrates, but there's no reason why it not should steam up in the other way. But now, again, the way to it's cheap. I can make it go away. You see it going away on the screen? Uh, okay, let's save the situation by making it come the other way. I don't need it to come the other way here.
regular.com. And once you have constructed regular.com, division of any angle into two parts, the bisection is very easy, so you have constructed regular polygon. You might say, ah, but wait a minute. One pass, not. And it was already regular pentagon. One pass, regular three lots, correct or triangle. Well, you should make a knot with zero pass, <laughs> and that is the picture of the computer. And you get a regular three lots. So, so far we have been seeing um, all those different toys that illustrate the different ways in which the models of applied mathematics can break, and we are taking the case and extreme cases each time. The next um, stage in breakage is that, okay, we have seen the discontinuous limit of the model, and for example, the change in hand like viscosity. Can you produce some sort of breakage within the model without messing around with parameter? we get some finite as well. When you drop a coin, you hear this very characteristic noise. So characteristic that if you hear this in a restaurant, for example, in a bar, you know that somebody dropped a coin. But here's a coin that is very heavy. Um, I'd like to ask my team, the supervisor, William Brother, is it heavy? Yes. Thank you very much. It's very heavy. So, because it's heavy, when I launch it, yeah, it's, it, the motion lasts a long time, and because it lasts a long time, we can see many features of this motion that otherwise escape our attention. You can already see and hear that something seems to be accelerating, going faster and faster. But note, the pattern of light on this surface reflected the rotation. The skin is not accelerating in any. And the skin is quite steady, but nonetheless, something goes faster and faster. That seems to be a flapping motion of the disk. It's completely natural. I'm not you know, driving it with some magic or magnetic and so on. It's going faster and faster, the motion is lasting longer than I thought, but it will come, eventually come to a stop point, and when it does, I'd like to invite you to watch, uh, especially to listen to the noise that it gasps at the end. It's not coming. So 
instead of going to a, a bucket chamber, I went to a lady's accessory shop because it's a bracelet. Now, in this case, there is no air trapped underneath the disc for the good reason that there is no disc. Now, I shall try to spin it. I see. Here, in the first phase, you see this um, bracelet spinning vertically up. Very beautiful. It's like a ballerina spinning and spinning. But you see that soon she will become tired and transit to a different mode of dynamics. She's about to start transiting. Now, so in that second phase, you see that it's exactly the same motion quality as the disc. And you hear exactly the same kind of shadowing. So the air under the, under the disc has nothing to do with the matter. In fact, what has to do with the phenomenon, in order to make this go lower and lower, there's dissipation energy, and that's the key. What's dissipating energy to make it lower and lower? Is this, when I launch this, do you see that the surface of this mirror is vibrating? Yeah. Do you see that the image is vibrating? Yeah. Well, of course, because as this thing goes around and around, its point of contact, which is also the point of pressure, is migrating and going around in a certain motion. And that makes the support vibrate, which sends out an elastic wave, you can call that phonons if you like, which carries off energy which never comes back. And that's what's dissipating energy. Does. And that's completely compatible if you couple that with the Appel, you can do the full analysis. In order to convince you that it is the vibrations or the phonons that's doing the dissipation, let's redo the experiment, but on a good absorber of elastic energy, such as the human body. You know that human bodies, especially mine, have been designed to withstand all sorts of shocks. <laughs> so, watch how long the experiment lasts when I do it on my hand. That's it. The entire energy escapes through my arm, through my body, through the hand. And that's how it's working. So, in, in a nutshell, you have a finite hand similarity, which is due to an interesting dissipation of energy. Okay, we have made a tour of many different models and many different toys from stability to stability and stability to phase transition or the affordable phase transition by application to um, discontinuities and, and to planet and singularity and so on. And that's quite an ecology, if I may use the term, of different scientific concepts and interesting phenomena, phenomena and ideas. One can ask, where do those uh, phenomena and ideas live? Or where does science live? You know, there is a common conception, impression, shall I say, that science, in particular mathematics, is in the hands of um, dignified professors. They wear thick glasses and maybe white lab coats, and work at huge computers churning out numbers or uh, on expensive of scale equipment in August laboratories. There is something to be said for that impression, certainly. It's, it's true that institutionalized science is extremely important. But at the same time, um, this impression leads to another impression, which is that when those August professors or students close their books, go on holiday, science stops existing. Surely that is not true, because while we are on holiday, as we we are fed up with science and don't think about it. Nature keeps practicing science. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in every corner of the universe. Everywhere. So, conversely, if we look anywhere, every corner, any corner of the universe, at any time, we should be able to find nature practicing science. This finally leads us naturally to the question of why are we looking at toys? There is a relatively little known work of Aristotle called the Partibus Animalium, or Parts of Animals, concerning, and there is a passage in it concerning Heraclitus. Heraclitus was a Socratic philosopher, flourished in Ionia around 550 BC, 600 BC, excuse me. Um, he was a big scientific or 
that should not be stopped with you. If you like you know, the equipment in the antiquity of a great professor of mathematics at Princeton University. And the, here is the passage rendered in English. In all natural phenomena, there is something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet the Heraclitus. And when they entered and saw him in the kitchen, warming himself at the stove, they hesitated. But Heraclitus said, Come in, don't be afraid. There are gods in here. Enaika Kai in Thousand Deus. I have been acutely aware that throughout this talk, um, this audience contained um, several teachers of mine. It was like passing a giant version of the general story again. <laughs> so, to all of you in the audience, and to the Princeton Mathematics Department, which was my mathematical nest. And to the Princeton University Press, and especially to the spirit of Martin Gardner. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. So again, you're watching um, Princeton. My battery is low, and I don't know how to. Uh, uh, for the, there's no plug. For, for the panel, for the panel, we have to find a place to plug it in, um, and maybe up closer. No. I have to sign. I have to sign off because I have to go up there. Yeah. Can you plug it in and leave it sit before you go up there? There's no plug. Up, up there, there is though. There. Were you able? To, were you able to hear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, but gravity 
is not that important. And also, you probably, okay, so you can do this on some other context, for example. And imagine, for example, the flow is transparent. And you sort of lie upside down and then look up at the experiment from the flow. What you're going to see is, okay, so you remember that the end of that hint, in this case black, is the color of the scope of the But if, that's because we are observing this thing from above. If you observe the phenomenon from below, what you will be seeing is the orange end of that hint. And that's because of the same energy outside. And in fact, if observation from below is something that you can do, just do it wrong. By the way, glass doesn't work because it has a lot of friction. Did you notice? And glass is very bad. But you can do it on the transparent glass. You can see exactly. Any other other questions? I have to move the computer up. Yeah, yeah. And even if we're it's talking about all the 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 do I have to sign in. off and sign on? You're talking about no, no, not oh, if you okay. just walk up there and plug it in. Uh, are there any nice ways I'm to almost the battery's almost dead. Well, okay, well, if you to sign it off, off. If, if you sign off, then you have to come back in in the same way and we'll wait, wait for you. And there we go, we lost our feed. Um, <laughs> live from Princeton University, of course, live. Uh, technical uh, issues, but Scott, you know, we, we witnessed uh, a remarkable, I think his name is Tashidi, is that correct? Did I did I say it right? Tashidi? Uh, let me uh, pop up the... Uh, I believe it's uh, Tashidi. Um, Tadashi. Tadashi. Tadashi Takeda. Yes, that's it. Yeah, and, and of course, <laughs> a fascinating uh, explanation of, of motion which uh, y you can take that uh, that principle and apply it to several things. What comes to mind for me is that old Gravitron at the fairgrounds where we'd stick to the wall. There's, there's some elements of that, although he's talking about uh, dual motion, and usually the Gravitron is uh, single motion. Single, um, yeah. And unfortunately, the, the screen didn't really pick up the contrast, so we couldn't see what everybody else was seeing from the overhead. Mm-hmm. But uh, I've actually seen that demonstrated, and it, it's uh, when you first see it, it's not intuitive as to exactly what's going on, and you really wonder why you're seeing certain colors and not other colors because of the colored dots on the tubes. And then when you actually go in and you see the translation plus the rotation, you start to get a better idea of you know which period is which, and uh, so why you're seeing one more than the other. So it really is kind of interesting when you're going through it. Uh, you could hear and verbally describe it. But it kind of loses a little bit when you don't actually see it first, because you want to, you know, you get surprised first, and then when the explanation comes through, you can kind of understand where it comes. But the bigger point, as far as you know, celebration of mind goes, is it's the curiosity of it. When you see something you don't understand, and then you start delving into it, and then doing experiments on it to see, well, how does it shift? So, for instance, with the swirling balls. Um, to be adding more balls and say, well, does it just keep doing the same thing? It's like, no, it doesn't. No. And then which, trying to describe that. Which doesn't logically make any sense. Uh, logically, of course, until you apply that that theory and that principle to it. Right. And, well, you also have, you start getting more and more complex systems. When you, when you only have one ball, the system is fairly simple. As you start adding more and more balls to it, it's becoming more complex, and the interactions become more complex. And, when you compare that to you know fluid motion and turbulent flows, it gets really complex. So, but as you walk up into it, you can kind of build up how that theory comes out. But and you're you know, you're absolutely right as he visually uh, describes it, and and the contrast wasn't there, but we could hear it as well. And there's not just right. a visual difference taking place; there's an audible difference that's taking place too. And that that was fascinating to me. Uh, because I never thought about it on that level, but you, you can clearly, especially with the bracelet, the bracelet was, I mean, w what a dynamic shift in the sound that's taking right. place. Right. And again, for those of you who are watching uh, on our website, or if you're watching us on social media, YouTube, or perhaps Google+, uh, welcome. 
We are uh, broadcasting live from Princeton University. Currently, we uh, do not have a feed. We're keeping our fingers crossed for the next few moments for Mark Sedadicati, the president of Gathering for Gardner, to bring us another window into Princeton for what is taking place there. Now, earlier uh, in the first part of their celebration, they had a lecture uh, that just wrapped up and is just uh, in the process of rolling over to their panel discussion where we're going to be uh, hopefully viewing an excellent panel discussion on remembering Martin Gardner. And of course, Princeton University Press uh, just released uh, the new autobiography called Undiluted Hocus Pocus. You can find out details about it on our website, celebrationofmind.org, or you can search it and Google it uh, and find it on Amazon as well. Uh, so some of the people that are going to be speaking are Martin's friends, Jim Conway, is uh, going to be there as well as uh, got to look at my name here, Neil Sloan. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit, uh, Scott, about those two names for those uh, who are who may be watching or tuning in from out in the uh, Google and YouTube realm about Neil Sloan and and Jim Conway? I think you mean John Conway. John, John Conway. Conway. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm juggling so many different things here. Uh, Jim Gardner is Jim going to be on the and the panel and as well? Jim. And Jim will be there as well, uh, Martin's and, but son. He's, of course, Martin's son, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically have known, they both knew, well, actually everybody on the panel knew Martin uh, for many years. Um, and, uh, in fact, John Horton Conway, when he was introduced through Martin, uh, now he always had, uh, he's been well known before, but he was introduced to a broader audience with his game of life, uh, which... Martin uh, talked about in his uh, mathematical games column for Scientific American magazine, and uh, but I think he's probably uh, best known for his uh, surreal numbers. Um, but very famous mathematician, and uh, Neil Sloan, I believe, worked at Bell Labs, and he has a nonprofit that he is running now, and I don't have the name of it on me, but I can Google that and find out very quickly. Sure. Uh, and John, excuse me if you're watching on demand, I apologize. I, I've had uh, Jim Gardner's uh, name in my head all day, so I confused John with Jim in that uh, instance, but I apologize. Nonetheless, I know him best for his uh, tongue exercises and his ability to do what uh, you know very few people actually can do uh, in the form of the tongue exercises. Have you seen this? I have not. <clears throat> it's phenomenal. He can roll his tongue. He can expand his tongue. He can twist his tongue upside down. And there's one other tongue trick that he does, which supposedly only uh, less than 2% of the people in the world can do all four of these tongue tricks. And, of course, he can do them all. So uh, if uh, we get a chance to uh, speak with our panel guests, uh, maybe we'll see some tongue tricks as well. If you're joining us out there, um, as well, you can hang out uh, in our audience green room, which is taking place also at this web address, celebrationofmind.org slash live. Just go there and click on the Join Current Hangout button, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll try to answer them on air as well, as we're currently awaiting Mark Sedaticati to rejoin our broadcast and bring us a live feed back from Princeton University. And uh, should be an exciting panel uh, as well. I know he was running out of battery and needed a place to uh, hook up, so hopefully he gets that plugged in and, and back online for us uh, before the panel actually begins. But uh, definitely something uh, extraordinary going on right. there at Princeton <laughs> University tonight. Also tomorrow, another special event, a celebration of mind live from New York City from the National Museum of Mathematics, or MoMath, in downtown New York City, where a lot of these same guests that are here at Princeton tonight will also be in attendance at that event. So we'd like to thank Vicki Kern for her efforts in uh, putting all of this together and arranging it for both Princeton and MoMath. And we're excited for tomorrow's uh, Celebration of Mind, which we will see a little different, a, a little bit of a different format, more of an interactive, hands-on, Well, I think if you're in the New York there. area, <laughs> oh, it, it freezes from time to time. And, right. of course, if you're in the New York area 
you can uh, visit the National Museum of Mathematics tomorrow and take part in the celebration physically. So how's that for a plug? Yeah. Get it uh, just there? to fill in on Neil's foundation, because I was trying to remember the actual name of it, it's the um, Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, which is OEIS Foundation. Um, but it's a database of integer sequences that he's been working on for a long time. Um, he did work at Bell Labs. And, uh, is British also? Uh, yes, British US. I mean, he's been here for a long time. Um, he's into uh, common combinatorics and uh, error correcting codes. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe I've met him could, through the Gathering for Gardner. Maybe you could explain what that foundation is all about and what that what that concept is because I you t you say it um, you know better than I could say it and and I have no idea what it actually means. So can you tell us what building this type of of an is it an algorithm? That, that well, no, no, it's it's different ways of putting sequences together. So you know, quickly you could just go on Wikipedia and look at the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, which you know it's not it just gives you a summary of some of the things. But such as uh, non-integers, um, you can have one fifth, one fourth, one third, two fifths, one half. Various ways of going through and putting these combinations. The uh, you can also do it uh, as sequences of denominators, as opposed to sequences of numerators. Um, so instead of keeping the denominator solid. I guess the larger question that some people would have is why it is important. Um, and they're important for various things, but in terms of um, encoding, there are ways that you can encode data using these. AJ, I can't hear you. Do you kind of drop out? Yeah, I uh, muted the microphone as okay. I took a call there from Princeton University. They are getting set up, and they will be back and joining us in, in just a few moments, so we're looking forward to that. Didn't mean to cut you off, but I, I was listening in one ear, Scott, as I was <laughs> <laughs> getting the updates in the other. <laughs> well, I would recommend, um, actually, Neil may talk about it a little bit in this speech, so I don't want to jump into it too far, but um, there are references available online, and his foundation in particular is the OEIS Foundation, where you can look at it. I know he's devoting a lot more of his time to that now. And again, these are scheduled guests. I'm not 100% certain whether everybody on the lineup has made it to uh, to Princeton and is there for the panel discussion. However, I do know Jim is there because Jim Gardner joined us in our hangout before we went on air, and he looks quite damper in all white patent leather shoes. So he's he's <laughs> going to be there, and we know Mark Zedekati is there because he brought us the uh, the um, fee the from fee. the lecture. And I believe Colm is there as well uh, he's, because Colm has been tweeting. He's been tweeting, tweeting, so yeah. so <laughs> it should be a, a dynamic event once we can get connected back into the room. And it's kind of funny to see how Mark uh, leans over the side of the computer. <laughs> as he's, you can just imagine Mark sitting in the audience at Princeton with his laptop on his lap and. Uh, adjusting this and of course his volumes all the way up so the moment we start talking it's echoing through. right everyone else hears it yeah <laughs> here we go Mark said Mark how to be back with us hi Mark can I have my sound off yes uh, just turn your sound all the way down and, and turn your volume all the way down okay there just hold go. this up when you get this is, needs to be plugged in so it's plugged in you can you can use what, this one. Can we put it on the side? Maybe over there, yeah. but I don't want it to fall. No, no, all guard it. Just guard it. If anybody goes through it, can, we, can we check that viewpoint? I'll Wait. go sit on the panel and you just get it set up somewhere. You can just let it rest there. Perfect. And that's Mark Mitten joining Mark. Yeah, Mark Mitten. Okay. And that's what you're looking at. That's the live. He's on live, and so is Scott. Can you make sure that we're seeing everybody? Just kind of keep an eye on that. Is it balanced okay? Yeah. Again, well, we should uh, get to while they get their set up there, we'll just mute the uh, microphone and uh, make sure that we can turn it on and off there. So we'll just bring the volume down a little bit. Can you see so. the panel? Yes, 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 you we can. can. Yes. 
And of course, we're uh, very fortunate as they get into the, the moments here of getting everything set up to have this window to Princeton and this uh, exciting panel. It's going to take place tonight, and I think down there on the end is Cole. It's, uh, it's all right. So let's go. Let's start. Almost the far end. And uh, sitting next to Colm is Jim. Conway. We're set to go, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Be careful of the computer. Okay. Are you guys ready? Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mark Sennett-Cotty. Mark was born in New York City and received his BFA in Art and Design from the School of Visual Arts. He later became a member of the faculty where he created and taught the first toy and game design class in the world. He has created home versions of TV game shows including Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, two of my favorites actually. In 2001, Mark was magic consultant for Mattel's Harry Potter license. He is co-founder and organizer of the Gathering for Gardner, a conference that celebrates the life of Mark and Martin Gardner, which you all know. And in March of 2012, he was appointed president of the Gathering for Gardner Foundation. And I found this really cool fact, and I love it. He has the largest novelty pin collection in the world with over 10,000 pins, which he uses in lectures on creativity, and it was on the cover of Magic Magazine. I think that is the coolest hobby I ever heard of. <laughs> so Mark is going to introduce the other panel members to you, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. Thanks. Hello, I'm Mark Sidney and we're here to talk about Martin Gardner and memories and, and different things about Martin. And today we have uh, John Conway to my right. We are very honored to have Jim Gardner, Martin's son, and Paul McClaney, uh, how do you say the last name? Okay. Okay. Uh, who is a magician and who just uh, recently published an incredible book on mathematical card magic. And I think we'll start the uh, discussion with John to my right. My. Yes. Uh, well, I'm just going to give some reminiscences of uh, you know, my interactions with Martin Gardner. And they started when, with Martin Gardner's first article in Scientific America, which was not part of his column. It was an article in the body of the magazine about hexaflexagons. And in that, he said, um, that you could also make hexaflexagons have six triangles. And they fold in various ingenious ways. But he said there were also tetraflexagons. And so far, nobody had found a theory of that. And so with my undergraduate friends uh, in college at Cambridge, you know, I determined to try and find a theory. And we sat up overnight making dozens, hundreds actually, of tetraflexagons, and then eventually we found the theory. And I wrote to Martin and said, you know, here it is. And then, but later on, uh, I started visiting Martin Gardner. As I grew a little bit older, uh, I sort of used to stop uh, and stay with him every now and then when I crossed the Atlantic. And uh, the first time I did stay with him, the first time I met him in person, was quite interesting. He said, uh, oh, I'll take you up to my den. You can play with anything in there. Uh, and now, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have to be back in 20 minutes or so because I've got to collect my two boys from school. One of these young boys from school is sitting at the other end there. And um, so I didn't quite know what to do. There was a little semicircular table let down from the wall in one place. And it had a, a sort of little collection of drawers on top of it. And I pulled one drawer. <laughs> the reason I was so surprised is there's a mechanical insect. I don't think it was actually an insect. I think it was supposed to be a spider, and they're not insects originally. Um, it jumped out and walked around on this semicircular table. And then it was in danger of falling off as it from this, so it turned around automatically. A very simple little thing. It, it had, so to speak, no works except a little bit of clockwork in the swing. I don't know, but a very ingenious object. Um, then Martin came back and uh, told me various things. But uh, the next time <coughs> I met him, 
we made up a party of about eight people and went to a restaurant in Dobbs Ferry, fairly nearby. And uh, it was a cheap restaurant. Uh, it had what I think is a deal table anyway, a good thick block of wood in the middle. And the waitress came round and sort of dealt the plates very casually onto the table. And then she came and dealt cutlery onto the table as well in the same way. Uh, I was sitting next to Martin, and he picked up his knife, fork, and spoon and dropped them through the plate onto the table below. So I'm describing what conjurers call, I believe, the effect, not what actually happened. But it certainly looked as though it happened. And the waitress screamed. And it was so astonishing, you know, and impossible, so to speak. And then Martin um, picked up everybody's cutlery and sent his in a con more or less continuous stream through his place onto the table below. And, went. and I said, you must show me how you did. No, I think after, as we left, I think I said, you must show me how you did that trick with the cutlery. And he said, later, later. And he said, but I'll tell you one thing now. I wouldn't have done it if that restaurant hadn't been particularly dark. <laughs> um, and um, later never came. I think I forgot to ask him later that visit. I don't really know. Anyway, I never understood that. Um, what else? Um, well, we can move on to Jim. Yes, that's a good idea. Jim, yeah. do you have anything to add? Yeah, what, was, I, what was Martin like to have as a father? Yeah, I, I, I would say he seemed like any other father to me. I think the difference probably was is, is many of the other kids, their fathers went off to work every day and came back. Uh, Dad went up to the third floor of the house. And, and this was and Hastings this on was Hudson? Hastings on Hudson and... and in Dobbs Ferry, it was the second floor of the house. And so I had the benefit of always seeing him in the morning, always seeing him when he would come home. And then I suppose th there, was th there was the whimsical side of Dad, that um, you never really knew at what age he was going to do tricks like that. And Dad, one of his favorite hobbies, of course, was magic. And that would have fallen into the category of impromptu magic. But Mark, it, it, is, it, would that be in his uh, encyclopedia? Oh, you, no. you, you well, I don't have. Yeah, Mark's kind of the the. We've been talking. I just met Mark about two weeks ago. He came and gave a lecture at the University of Oklahoma, where where I'm a social scientist. Uh, my background is uh, special education and educational technology. And, and Mark seems to really be able to do very well looking up any of the tricks that I might have known in, da in Dad's encyclopedia. In but so I guess the comment, you never knew what was going to come from Dad. And growing up in the house, it wasn't like, ah, here's the puzzle of the day and here's the puzzle of the week. But that, that little device, uh, I forget the name of the stick that, that twirls, I have a memory of just one day Dad walking, coming to the table, and he had cut out something like that. And it had this little, he said, look at this interesting thing. And then he'd do that. How do you think it works? And so there would be one of those, one of those puzzles. And otherwise, I think a lot of people have remarked coming to the house. And, you know, there's a good chance that I've met some of you. Um, when I, when I was much younger, and I just don't have a memory. Uh, but I'm sure many, many people of different backgrounds, magicians, mathematicians, Alice experts, experts in other areas of literature, came through the house that myself growing up, uh, I never really realized. Um, other than, obviously, it was when uh, James Randi would come over the magician, the skeptic. Uh, that was always the show, so I made sure to be there. And then the, the other memory that I seem to have is uh, 
either through correspondence, I don't know how they met originally, uh, maybe Dad's written something somewhere, uh, the Danish mathematician Pete Hein, I remember distinctly came and he stayed at our house for a week. And he'd go into the city, do something, come back, he and Dad would would go upstairs and talk about things. Uh, but Pete Hine is one of those people. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll kind of be the color commentator for other elements or for questions on that. But I'll let Colin say something. Well, I'm actually a mathematician. And uh, to me, I think Martin was certainly the uncrowned prince of recreational mathematics. mathematics. Uh, but more importantly, the best friend mathematics ever had. And that's actually the title of an article I wrote in this post. He was also, as we've heard, a first-class magician and inventor of magic. But he was a mere journalist, as he would remind people who thought he was a card card mathematician. And yet, he did more in the profession to put fun and thought-provoking mathematics center stage for several generations of people, uh, not only here, in the space age, a space race era, but throughout the world. And I, it is my hope and belief that despite the obvious limitations of the reach of mathematics popularization, if his legacy is carefully curated, uh, his works will be remembered well into the 22nd century, not just today, but back only in the works of people like Charles Dickens and Mark Twain and different writers. Obviously best known as a writer, incredibly, his writing career spanned 80 of his 95 and a half years. He first published in the spring of 1930, at the age of 15 and a half. The class is very important to that young. And his last article, which I'll mention again in a minute, was actually published at the age of 95 and a half. In spring of 2010, and um, an obvious question is, you know, for a man who published so much and wrote over 100 books, how do you keep up the quality and the productivity? Well, in his case, if you read his memoir, which just came out, it's obvious that the man read and thought from a very young age, just constantly. He wasn't writing something; he was reading something, or thinking, or discussing with people. And uh, there's an incredible breadth and depth of interests that he had passions that he had in his early days up to the end. And he wrote about many of them, not just mathematics. He had top-notch material, terrific diversity of topics, an excellent taste in selecting what to write about, and of course, admirable clarity of thought and great economy of words. He got to mix with some of the greatest creative minds of his age. Uh, Escher, Bob Hummer, the magician, Isaac Asimov, Salvador Dali, Mandelbrot. These are people he knew on the first major terms. And the influence went both ways. Because actually, Asimov uh, was influenced by the Alice Munnerland annotated work and helped start a trend where you know, other people wrote annotated works of it, annotated versions of the famous books. Curiously, the thing he's most famous for is certainly in math community, his 300 odd Scientific American columns actually grew out of, as John Conway mentioned, the hexaplexicum article written at the end of 1956. But that, in turn, was inspired by something that started right here. In Princeton in 1939, Princeton Flexigan Committee, which had among its esteemed members Richard Klein, here in 1939. If you don't know about hexaflexigons or if you'd like to see an updated version, I would strongly encourage you to uh, take a look at some videos that my heart put up about a year ago. She did a series of four videos, one of them got five million hits within a week. Not videos don't usually get five million hits. They're quite remarkable. And like Martin, she's continuing a, tra a tradition of somebody without a math official training, formal math training reaching millions of people. Martin had apparently a million readers during his heyday at Scientific American. It was also the famous NPR car talk story, if you don't know that. The car talk guys used to start their shows with puzzlers, and they often nicked them from Martin. Uncredited. Uh, Martin made it after their 2CD 25th anniversary set. Perhaps they were feeling a little guilty for having screwed up back in the 90s. So inadvertently, I asked that Martin to die. When he hadn't died, I think Jim can tell you the rest of that story. Yeah, that was my 15 moments of fame. So the best way I can say is I was I was at our house um, in Norman, Oklahoma. And on a Saturday morning, I'd be tinkering, uh, doing something with gadgets or whatever. And, and I'm in a, kind of a part of the house, and in the background, car talk is playing. And, and I hear, blah, 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 Martin Gardner. And, and, and by the time I was able to get in there, they, they had moved on, and that was before they had podcasting. So luckily, I, I had a colleague who seemed to always listen to car talk and other elements, and he said, oh, oh yeah, they were talking about how it was a puzzle, and this person presented it, and how they said, um, 
that they thought it was um, actually printed by Marilyn Bo Savoy. And everyone knows that Marilyn Bo Savoy has stolen all her puzzles from Martin Gardner, but that doesn't matter because Martin Gardner's dead. And, and I'm going, <laughs> oh, really? Um, and of course, then my colleague in the College of Ed didn't know that I was Martin Gardner's son, so we had that revelation. So I, I ended up sending a, an email um, on, on Car Talk. And Within maybe 48 hours or 72 hours, I get this email back saying, really, or it was from one of their people, um, oh my gosh, the guys are whatever or, or something. Uh, do you think we could get Martin Gardner to appear on the show? Can we call him and tell them that, that he's not dead? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then I, I launched what I would say is, is kind of a... It's a set pattern that I've done many times uh, over my life, uh, going back from when people would discover uh, who, who I was the son of. And that uh, they would then say, well, would he come talk? Would he come give a lecture? Those of you who, who knew Dad personally knew that uh, he, he was amazing in print. Uh, but he actually had a fear or no desire to talk in front of a crowd larger than maybe four or five close friends and colleagues. And so I would say, well, I'll tell you right now, the answer is likely going to be no, because he doesn't have to do this. But in the spirit of everything, I will ask him. And as usual, I would ask him. And he had no idea about car talk. And thus, um, I sent back the decline. They said, well, would he give us a puzzle? And so then, uh, Dad having no understanding, we went through different iterations, some that were, the best way I can say, the puzzle was mathematical in nature and involved some algebraic uh, formula or whatever that would never work on the radio. Or we went to another one, which was, and kind of like a point on a cylinder, a car, on, a, on a car, cars rolling, which the other person at the other end got immediately until we landed on the, the three light bulb uh, puzzler. And then my 15 minutes of fame was I got to call in and tell the guys how I was pretty sure that I thought that they made a mistake. Martin Gerber wasn't dead. And I asked my father, who was a big fan, I uh, knew his work very well to see whether Martin Gardner was in fact dead. And he replied back, no, he was pretty sure Martin Gardner was not dead. And then we did the reveal, and we did the message. So that's kind of the story behind that. <laughs> and they and replayed then, that in June of 2010. You can get the podcast. They replayed this, the setting from the 90s, that conversation. Yeah, so uh, we honored Martin every two years with an event called The Gathering for Gardner, and that was organized originally by Tom Rogers, who was a, a businessman in Atlanta, and knowing that Martin didn't travel, that didn't speak, uh, Tom wanted to find some way to um, kind of honor him with a little party, and it, and it started as just people that actually knew Martin, and to bring them together, and at that time, Martin was living in uh, North Carolina, which was not that far from Atlanta. So, and Tom had, was visiting him on a regular basis, and I had also visited him in North Carolina with Tom on some different occasions. And, that, and Tom figured it was doable to have a little gathering because Mark agreed to attend. And so that started out as a one-time event, and it was so successful and, and uh, so uh, interesting that uh, uh, people started to ask Tom, well, why don't you do it again? Why don't you do it again? And uh, so... It became a biannual event and slowly grew over the years. And in March, at the end of March this coming year, will be the 11th uh, gathering for Gardner. And uh, so that uh, that's an invitational-only event, but you can go to the website Gathering for Gardner, just Google Gathering for Gardner. And then when Martin passed away in uh, May of 2010, uh, many people were asking Tom, uh, 
well, what are you going to what are you going to do? You're going to have a memorial service. Well, well Martin uh, didn't. Uh, he he specifically stated that he didn't want a memorial service, and so we tried to think of what we can do. So we thought, well, if we had a party or something, it would uh, it would have to be in only one location, and people would have to spend money in common. It really didn't make sense, and so we thought about some way of. Uh, getting everybody together through the internet since we're in the internet age and we decided to have a, a instead of a memorial service a, a celebration a, a global celebration of Martin his work and everything he's interested in so it's called a celebration of mind and that's what you're attending tonight this is the fourth one um, and uh, we're linked by the internet we're actually being broadcast live now the panel at least if you can look up on a computer and if you go to celebrationofmind.org, you'll find uh, uh, every year now on October 21st. We picked October 21st because that was Martin's birthday. And uh, this, as I say, small groups of people from around the world gather, and anybody can host an event. So it's free. It doesn't cost anything. But it's a global party, kind of like New Year's Eve, when uh, many people in many different places celebrate uh, separately, sometimes people have big parties on New Year's Eve, sometimes just a couple at home. Well, we're all the same. That's the spirit of it. We're, it's a global celebration, not any individual single event. It's the fact that people around the world, and I think this year we had over 70 countries, and last year we even, even had something on the South Pole. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons. That's the reason why we're here tonight. So, John. Anything to add to anything? Well, I'd like to say something about Martin's autobiography. Um, uh, Vicky asked me to write a little blurb for that. And in that blurb, I said that Martin was, I think I described him as the most learned person I ever met. And that might seem to be a bit of an exaggeration or something. Many people think of him only in terms of his column or his you know, reviews of books or something. But he knew so many things in so many different subjects. And, you know, uh, in his earlier days, he spent lots and lots of time at the New York Public Library in 42nd Street. Everything he did was well researched. Uh, I was really very surprised when he wrote various fairly recent articles involving quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a, a very difficult subject to, to get right, so to speak, not to make silly mistakes. He, he never made any mistakes in that. Absolutely astonishing man. Well, that's all I want to say. I mean, I really meant it when I said he was the most learned man I've ever Paul, anything else you want to add? Well, I think Martin would want us to remember him first and foremost uh, as a rationalist and as a debunker of quackery, pseudoscience, silly science, and a rigid plan. In fact, his first book from the early 50s was on that topic. And one of the very last articles he published in the spring of 2010 was for a magazine that he had found, uh, The Skeptical Inquirer. And that was called uh, Oprah Winfrey, Bright but Gullible Billionaire. So you can look it up on the web if you're interested. Uh, I met him for the first time in the mid uh, part of the last decade, I visited him in Oklahoma, and I found him amazingly humble and unwavering modest. He worked long and hard every day, and correspondence reading and writing, and often worked standing up, which was quite extraordinary, at a stand-up desk. He was not overly impressed with his own credentials or achievements. But um, as, as mentioned, I asked him once if he, you know, why he didn't lecture, and he said, well, I'd be a terrible lecturer. I suppose it was a remarkably inaccurate assessment. He was very articulate. And would, you know, but on stage fight the first few times I've ever been asked. He would have been an excellent teacher or lecturer. The last time I spoke to him, I used to telephone from airports. You'd have that one hour before you fly boards, and you're going to do it, go through your phone. I'll call Martin, it's been a few months. I called him from Logan Airport in Boston. And we had the usual conversation where I'd say hard things, and he'd give an uncle little answer, and, you know, have you had any interesting visitors lately? He said, no. He always gave that answer. And I'd say, oh, really? And then he'd say, oh, Randy was here, or Teller was here. But this time he said, oh, I did have a visitor, he said. And I was very, very surprised. I said, what was that? He said, Richard Dawkins came to see me. And I said, really? And he said, yes, I have no idea why. And I said, Martin, you're famous. And he completely poo-pooed that. He said, no, no. I said, you've written books on theology and philosophy and religion. So was Dawkins. I think he probably has something to talk about. What did you talk about? 
And he said, that was the funny thing he said, Duff was on his way to the airport, he'd given a talk at the university and he was in a hurry. And we talked about baseball and grandchildren and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And then Duff stood up and said, I have to go, I've got a flight to catch. And Martin said, not so fast. I think we're supposed to talk about it. <clears throat> and they had a brief conversation. And then I had to go for my flight. So I didn't get to hear the other conversation, but that was the last time I spoke to him. He was an incredibly decent man, and I'll give you an example of something that I found very touching. I visited him a couple of times, and one time we were going back to his room, and there was an elderly lady, this was a retirement home, an elderly lady, family corridor, who was weeping softly. And it was a little disturbing, and Martin said if she cries a lot, she'll probably be okay in a few minutes. And we went into his room, and we started talking, and I could hear a kind of howling as the door, and so could Martin. So he went down and he opened the door, and I went off to find the nurse to help do the situation. I the situation I to do. And it took me a while to find the nurse, and when I came back, it was over. Martin and her were sitting down, almost holding hands, having a nice conversation. Martin had calmed her down. Uh, it was very touching. Very successfully calmed her down. And the next time I went to see him, I asked him how she was. And he said, oh, sadly, she passed away. And he was about to change the topic, and he said, oh, you know, I found out something interesting about her. Apparently, she was a mathematician. A very good one. And I said, really? Did you find out who she was? And he forgot. That was another trail that we never picked up on again. But I just found that amazing. He was a busy man. He kept writing, but he also had time to make sure he had him for some of that. Yeah, I, I think you know, he was um, extremely humble. Um, he, he, in most cases, was was very giving to other people. Your comment earlier about his his ability to write on quantum quantum mechanics or, or whatever. I think also he, as I understood it, he had correspondence with people all around the world and he had people in different domains that would clip things and send them to him. And so I, my, uh, my uncle Jim, who married dad's daughter Judy, was uh, I think a chemical engineer and, and he would be clipping certain things out and sending to Dad. And then someone in the area of magic, I'm sure, would be clipping things out, sending them to Dad. And then if they were of interest, Dad would start more correspondence, and then that would be some of the way he'd get some of his information. And that leads me to his famous files. They were legendary. In the age before the Internet, in the age before Google, Oh, the uh, Martin's filing cabinets were filled with all kinds of uh, interesting e files. five index cards. Yeah, yeah yes. yes. Remember those files? And we still have those index cards, and I think they're uh, eventually going to be on their way to add to the collection at uh, Stanford University. Uh, yeah, and some just I'm thinking of anecdotal things just to just to mention some different stories. Uh, of what I remember with Dad, um, Dad would not use a calculator to uh, balance his checkbook. He would use an abacus. <laughs> um, there's there's a story. My my uncle Jim said that growing up with my father, uh, he could pretty much kind of touch anything in his room except my dad's index cards. Mm -hmm. So even when he was in high school, he was filling up shoe boxes with index cards with with putting in those those different bits of information. So obviously at a very early age he was just really interested in gathering information and keeping track of it for himself. Right. He maybe he may never use it or something would come in and he'd use it at some point. Uh, Colm, you have something? He, uh, w one of his very first books was called Mathematics, Magic, and Mystery. And this is a phrase that the whole country I'm hoping is going to hear in the coming months because next April is Mathematics Awareness Month and in honor and part of Martin's Centennial, which is next year. The theme of Mathematics Awareness Month throughout the country next year is going to be Mathematics, Magic, and Mystery. The web page will be up in a month or two, and there's going to be 30 amazing activities for each month for each day in April, uh, many of which will reintroduce new generations to the cool stuff that many of us saw. I think, uh, that I did today. So his legacy will definitely live on.
by the way, that's one of my, that is probably my favorite of all the books in mathematics history. It still has got so much really uh, good stuff in it and it's uh, very simple to read. Uh, my favorite book and it's not very expensive, so if anybody doesn't have it, I highly recommend it. Uh, John, anything you want to add? No. Okay. Uh, how's our time going? Questions, if you have yeah, questions. I think it's about time for questions. Uh, yes, uh, Ron, do you have a question? Uh, I'm just curious, uh, in the age of the internet, did your dad get a chance to, to go online? Yeah, dad, um, you, you have to understand, being a university professor, I, I can't give you a quick answer. The long-winded version is, um, Dad, for many years, he, he did use a word processor. Uh, it was a piece of paper, a typewriter, uh, rubber cement, and scissors. And so the way Dad would work is he'd type, and then when he made an edit, he'd retype it, snip it out, and paste it over um, the, the, the original. Dad avoided using computers. Uh, and, and, and some of it was related to he just wasn't a technical, he was not a gadget uh, sort of person. Um, at one point when they were living in Hendersonville, and I framed everything I think in different variations of Apple computers, uh, someone was developing a set, a computer series, uh, I think it was going to be Martin Gardner's Math Puzzles. And it was running on the Apple IIc operating system. And they, they gave him an Apple IIc. And he spent some time, but I, but I made the mistake of sending him a chess program. And then he said he started playing chess quite often. And he said he knew he had to stop when he went to bed one night and closed his eyes and he saw the, the image of the chess uh, picture on there. And so he stayed away from computers, never used the word processor, and it wasn't until maybe 2006 or seven that I had been saying, Dad, you've just got to get onto the internet and this and that. And he'd say, oh, no, maybe, maybe next time or whatever. I, I finally gave him one of my older Apple Cubes. And I just, one day I walked in and I said, Dad, you're on the internet. I set him up and done all that. And within a couple months, he thought the Wikipedia, Wikipedia was the most amazing thing since sliced bread. And so he, he knew how to get to Wikipedia. Um, and pretty much just would click, would get there. That's what he used the internet for. And he, he, it, was, it was evolutionary for him in a lot of ways because he was able to get a lot of information, the basic information on the internet. But otherwise, no email, absolutely not, did not have any well, It feels like he was a one-man version of Wikipedia before there was the <laughs> <laughs> Well, in, in different areas, yes. Any other questions? Yes. One of my favorite books growing up was Dr. Regis. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, and, and the story, I think it's he talks about it in his autobiography. And the, the typical thing with Dad is I wouldn't hear about things until years later. So I, I think the first time I learned of the Gardner Gathering must have been Oh, by the way, there's going to be something on on a TV show about me. So when did they shoot the David Suzuki? Was that at the that second was, or I think the second? The one. second. So he and Mom went I to think the it's first. Okay. So you had already had two. Right. And Dad had never mentioned it to me. Right. And it just came up, and from then on, of course, we tried to get him to go, but it was like pulling teeth. Uh, but he I, I never heard that he had met Salvador Dali. And he talks in his autobiography about Dali approaching him 
actually wanting to meet Dr. Matrix. And his dad said, I had to let him down easily. <laughs> but that's so it's an interesting story of the autobiography. One of my favorite books uh, growing up of dad's was, uh, I think it was the Arrow Book of Math Puzzles, or maybe it was the Arrow Book of Science Puzzles. And that was just because it was pretty cool to go to school and you get your, you order your Arrow Books, and then all your friends would be picking up copies of books. By, by your father. And I wouldn't say anything, but it was, it was, that was just kind of a, uh, an interesting thing. And maybe in one of those books, he had a puzzle where you, you cut, cut off the box of a jewelry box, put in some cotton, and you were supposed to put your middle finger in and, and put, uh, what was Mercurica, or whatever you put on insect bites, and it was called the mummy's finger. And it was just interesting thing because everybody would get the book on one day, and then the next day about 13 or 14 kids would come to school with mummy's fingers. <laughs> of course, so. Any other questions? One question here. This is my question, but just a comment. I, I don't know how many other people in the room uh, can say this, but I actually heard the car talk. <laughs> I've completely forgotten about it until you just mentioned it. I thought that was, I love the Car Talk show, and uh, that episode was really great. And, and, they, and it's interesting. You, they're, I'm going to let out a secret because they're, they're no longer doing it. The, the shows are actually not live. They, uh, they give the number, but people call it, they call you back, and, and then they record it. They did edit sometimes. The Dawkins story is interesting. Um, because, and I did not know you were there for part of that. Or, or no, I just spoke to him on the oh, phone. Oh, okay. So I, I didn't go. I, I knew they had, they had called me to see if Dad would be interested. Dawkins was giving a lecture uh, on the University of Oklahoma campus, and Dad consented. And, and Dad shared it with me is, oh, I had a, this marvelous talk with Dawkins afterwards. We, you know, we talked about these things, and then he stood up to go. And, and I said, oh, and, and with Dad being very gracious, she said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry we, we had this time to talk, and we didn't get a chance to talk about God. And he said, Dawkins sat back down. <laughs> and, is, and so I, however long it happened, I don't know, but certainly that was something that Dawkins was interested enough to, to put on the pause button. Dawkins has given talks where he's spoken about what happened, what just happened, and that's what he said. Anybody else? Yes, Mark. Yeah, I um, have um, a question for Jim about, I guess for Jim and John and well, for all of you, about uh, Martin Gardner, the magician, as a magician. You know, like, uh, the sensibility and tricks and gags and things like that. Well, Martin really, of course, I'm a magician, so any time that I was with Martin, it would always be centered around magic, and we'd be doing tricks, and he always had such enthusiasm and curiosity, and I remember he always liked the rope, he liked rope tying tricks, and he always had a rope, and he was always, like, trying to tie it with one hand and doing something, and he... And he was like a little child, even up until the last time that I saw him in his 90s. Like, and he never lost his enthusiasm for magic, and was always very playful and curious, and just uh, loved magic. Uh, Paul, you know. His proudest creation, he's told uh, several people in his later years, was the wink change. And, uh, magician Joe Turner from Atlanta went out to see Martin with me once on a videotape in uh, teaching Joe how to do it. It's on YouTube somewhere, the wink change. Dad always had time for magicians to visit, I think. Um, and, and you'd never know who would drop in. So another story um, I found out maybe a week or two later, Dad said, oh, yeah, um, th this magician stopped by. Um, David Blaine, have you ever heard of him? That, that was in the nursing home, or the, the assisted living home where yeah. Martin was. And I guess, and then they did some, he, had, he was giving some talk in Oklahoma City, found out Dad lived there. And that would have been about, 
that would have been about seven or eight years ago when yes. David was very famous. And I think everybody at the nursing home or the assisted living home was very impressed. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they filmed something on that. I, mean, I, I, I continue, I, when, when Mark was giving his, his uh, lecture at OU and, and doing some magic afterwards, um, you know, word gets out, there's a magician in town that's well known, other magicians come. And, and I, I met two or three other people who said, oh, well, we knew your dad. And we would we'd drop, just drop in occasionally, or we'd go out and we, we'd show him some new tricks and he'd give us some insight on other tricks. And, uh, you know, that was just, I think, of all the things that, that was his hobby, that was what I think he enjoyed most in terms of just entertainment. Uh, never, never watched television uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, hardly watched it. Would listen uh, to the radio, I think, uh, at night. We were both fans of Gene Shepard and uh, other folks, but it was not a television <laughs> watch. You know, um, <clears throat> I must have been an innocent when uh, I read his Scientific American column for ages, and of course I saw occasional tricks mentioned in there. But, uh, you know, every mathematician seemed to have been turned on, so to speak, at an early age by Martin Gardner. And then when I went to the first gathering for Gardner, I realized that every professional magician seemed to have been turned on by Martin Gardner too. And then, quite often when describing these wonderful gatherings for Gardner, I've said, you know, what the audience is. It's half professional magicians, half professional mathematicians, and half weirdos. <laughs> and there's no contradiction between those things. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's thank the panel very much. Yes. I have a question. Does the celebration of mine, do they record? So, like, if somebody didn't hear something tonight, can you go back and listen to it, or does it just go live? Can you hear that, Aaron? Yes, it's recorded if you want to go back. Super. Let's go to the celebra celebrationofmind.org or Google Celebration of Mind and you'll come to the site. Okay, thank you everybody. And again, um as the panel disperses and meets the people that are there, I'm sure that uh, we'll watch the camera close out uh, the evening there at Princeton University. But uh, what a remarkable treat, Scott, huh? To, uh, it was a lot be of fun. I mean, I run into most of those guys at the gatherings for Gardner, but uh, I've only talked to Jim on the phone. I've never met Jim as a person. Just to just to be there and, and hear you know the stories from a son's point of view, what a, a fantastic perspective to add to the mix. And of course the, the panel uh, of guests there knowing Martin very well uh, speak you know still to this day very highly of him and will continue to uh, to do so for for many many years to come. Uh, it's. It's really remarkable how at the end there, um, uh, Mr. Conway, John Conway, says, uh, you know, that the gathering for Gardner is made up of half magicians and half mathematicians and half weirdos. <laughs> and I guess that defies all, all uh, logic, mathematics, magic, and weirdo. Well, I mean, if you're looking at set theory okay. combination where there's overlap between the two groups and weirdo category, I don't think I would have used weirdo per se, but um, it's definitely uh, a unique blend of people. It's um, probably one of the biggest things about so much uh, collaboration that goes on there where uh, magicians and magicians actually get together and do some projects together. So 
Uh, very cool. The thing that underlines most of them is their sense of curiosity. They're willing to let somebody else does something totally outside of what they do. And, uh, you know, just celebrate it for being as good as it is. Just so going to get a few snapshots of our panel uh, tonight. Again, we remind you that you are watching a, a live stream from Princeton University, Celebration of Mind. And uh, like Mark said, if you would like to learn a little more, or perhaps you tuned into this broadcast uh, later rather than earlier, uh, an excellent lecture given before the panel spoke this evening. Uh, you can find that on demand at uh, celebrationofmind.org slash live and uh, check out all of our uh, scheduled events uh, tomorrow taking place uh, live from the museum, uh, National Museum of Mathematics, MoMath. Uh, wonderful uh, to see another live feed coming out of New York City. Uh, bringing us activities and uh, things throughout the day, as well as special guest speakers, some of which were on this panel tonight. So, uh, Scott, thanks for doing the duration with me this evening. And as our panel disperses there, we'll just allow our, our viewers to be a fly on the wall until the, uh, the end of, uh, of the uh, gathering there, if you will, the celebration uh, wraps itself up as it's... Uh, Another wonderful, wonderful experience from uh, Princeton University and a viewpoint of uh, another fantastic celebration taking place this year. Any final thoughts, Formal presentations, the informal education went on for hours. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's no question that uh, the, there's definitely a collaboration of brilliant minds at one table so uh, an experience for you at home the viewers to, to take part in in this uh, particular panel of course Princeton University uh, press you heard them talk about it earlier uh, released the undiluted hocus pocus an autobiography on Martin Gardner and uh, it's available on uh, a number of uh, outlets online just Google uh, autobiography and Martin Bart Gardner, and I'm sure you'll find it uh, at Amazon as well as a few other locations. Now, if you're interested in hosting a celebration of mind yourself, uh, we encourage you to do so, and doing so is going to get you a special promo code for a 25% discount off the uh, 200 plus page hardbound, wonderfully designed, covered. Autobiography of Martin Gardner, uh, celebrating, of course, remembering Martin here at Princeton University tonight. So I encourage you to do that. For details on how to do that, just visit our website, celebrationofmind.org, and uh, sign up for your event, whether it's a limited or a public event like what you see here in Princeton. Uh, you'll be sent email details on how you, you can uh, enter that promo code when purchasing and save 25% uh, off a special introductory price of undiluted Hocus Pocus. Fantastic autobiography with an equally fantastic story that comes along with it. So again, you're watching uh, celebrationofmind.org slash live as we continue to come back in on uh, celebration taking place at Princeton University. I'm AJ Olson and Scott uh, down in Atlanta, um, all the way from the World Headquarters of Gathering for Gardner, and uh, we're going to sign ourselves off and allow you to uh, just continue to watch as the room disperses. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for uh, National, uh, National Museum of Mathematics celebration. And uh, until then, take care of yourself and each other. Well, oh, that sounds familiar, yeah. doesn't it? It is it. <laughs> and I can't describe it. I can't describe it. And we're trying our best. Also, Just talk to me. We'll do it. I love it. Yeah, yeah.
sign off Meanwhile, all continue. right bye everybody very good bye. thank you so See much you. thanks a lot it was a lot of fun right. well, sorry i want to ask a question can we already send uh, invitations for the next gathering or uh the invitations didn't come out but go to the website and you should come and there we go so uh wonderful evening again from uh celebration of mind dot org slash live uh, fantastic celebration taking place at Princeton University and hopefully you were lucky enough to see most of it in course if you missed any of it it is available in just a few moments after the video pro file processes you can go back and watch all of it on demand so if you missed any of the earlier lecture or maybe perhaps the beginning of the panel we encourage you to go back and watch it just dynamic uh, dynamic stories being told by friends and and of course the son of Martin Gardner, uh, longtime friends that knew him and knew him well. And uh, just a, another cherished evening on the celebrationofmind.org slash live. And with that, uh, one more time, Scott, I'll come back to you. And if you have any final thoughts, uh, this is the time to do it. Well, I'd mention that, uh, you know, these celebrations of mind, they, we talk about them being always on October 21st, but it's really on or around October 1st. You can hold a Good. celebration of mind anytime you want, and on the website we've got resources available. Do you have some things that you want to put in or some suggestions about different items? Hexaflexagons, uh, our thinky, the, the dragon illusion. Love it. Love it, etc. But just things to get you started to think about stuff. And uh, so, for instance, the illusion, you know, when you see the resource, it doesn't necessarily look like it's that complex. But when you actually put it together and demonstrate it, it's like, oh wow. Yeah, 
great introduction and of course our Saturday hangouts if you look you'll see also in the uh, resource areas like Scott explained everything is free and you can explore yeah. those resources and you can check out everything that's available to you to download and, and try this stuff and get a great introduction in, into this kind of uh, a concept of stimulating your mind and of course we want people to use their minds and that's what we're here for is asking you to do as well so uh, with that uh, I would look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow as we broadcast live from MoMath and uh, Scott's got his thinky about mine you can get yours too just visit that web address celebrationofmind.org and check out our resources and George in the audience hat, uh, chat room has got his thinky out there too. So it was a lot of fun, a great time hanging with you, Scott. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you again tomorrow as we broadcast our exciting event from New York City. From now until then, take care. We'll see you soon. See you, everybody.